Hello, everybody. I am Christina Margariti, and I'm the leader of Euroweb's Working Group 1. And along with my co-organizers, Hanna Lukesova, our Virtual Networking Support Manager, and Francisco Dodges, our Science Communication Coordinator, we would like to welcome you to the fifth presentation of our Advanced Analytical Techniques for Textiles Workshop. During the presentation, you are welcome to write your questions or topics for discussion in the chat, and you will be invited to speak at the end. We are very thankful today to have the contribution of Maria Joao Melo and Paula Nabais. Maria Joao Melo is a conservation scientist with a PhD in physical chemistry in 1995. She's a researcher at the Green Chemistry Associated Laboratory, LAQV Requimte, and Institute of Medieval Studies at Nova School of Science and Technology in Lisbon, and the head of the Cultural Heritage Line. Her research is focused on the preservation of medieval illuminations and the study of the causes of alteration of organic colorants in, comp in complex matrices. To achieve these goals, she also contributed to the development of advanced analytical techniques for colorant identification in artworks, such as microspectrofluorimetry. She also serves in the editorial board of Heritage Science and Dyes and Pigments. Her present challenge is to strengthen, strengthen her interdisciplinary research and approach at the frontiers of the social and natural sciences, promoting public engagement. Paula Nabais is a researcher at the Department of Conservation and Restoration at LAQV Requimte Research Unit of the Nova University in Lisbon. Her research has been dedicated to the study of organic colorants in artworks, more specifically yellow dyes. Today, Paula and Maria will give us a presentation titled A New Advanced Technique for the Characterization of Dyes in Ancient Textiles, Microspectrofluorimetry. And at this point, we would like to invite our speakers, Maria and Paula, to the virtual stand. Okay, thank you so much for your very kind words. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. So I, as I already shared with the, our a chairwoman, I'll be here just like uh, warming up a little bit for the important presentation that will be made by Paula, providing some context about what is this new advanced technique and why it is useful. So how to identify color in textiles. Color is one of the most important attributes in textiles when we are so fortunate as in this Inca fabric to have these beautiful colors, almost as pristine as when they were made. So how, how can we know how they were doing this and what kind of dyes they were using? Actually, in the past, Dyes were like and based on a handful of molecules, and um, I veer the antraquinone reds. I'm using some molecular structures because I think they, you know, they really tell a lot for some people. But uh, even if you cannot appreciate them totally, they are very beautiful structures. So these are the structures that are behind the reds. This is a lizarine. This is uh, purpurine, and in common with the yellows that could be also flavonoids, carotenoids, chalcones, some of the most common, both the reds and the yellows need to be captured into the fiber with an ion, a metallic ion, that in the past usually was aluminum ion using alum. Another dye, very important one, indigo blues, I should have put here some bromines and tell you that the indigo blue can be also a purple color, but anyway, this basic structure doesn't need uh, a, a metallic ion to be captured into the fiber. This structure, through the redox reaction, can become soluble and then precipitate inside the fiber. 
we will exemplify our methodology and approach using as example the reds the reds based on these antrachinone molecules. So these red dyes were really very important. They were used to dye textiles, but also in cosmetics, as watercolors and uh, as pigments. And many of, part of our research is really uh, identifying these dyes in manuscript illuminations from medieval uh, times as pigments or as watercolors. And they were extracted from plants, roots of plants and parasitic insects. And you see another, the other leading uh, character is this aluminum ion. So to be used to dye this textile, uh, this um, red needs to be captured. First, the fabric needs to be mordanted. That's usually the technical term used with alum. And this aluminum ion, as it has a three plus charge, is really very strongly bound into the fiber. And then it captures the colorant. So the colorant remains durable in the textile. And for example, in this beautiful portrait here, I'm sure, I'm sure, well, I'm, I will tend to say that the red that they are using in the, the fabric is vermilion, but what has vanished and was used to do this beautiful face of the young man was possibly uh, organic dye, uh, uh, organic um, lake. So extracted from roots of plants, so very much eaten. One of the most important species in Europe and not only was Rubia tinctorum. And we could extract alizarin from the roots of this plant. But we have also many parasitic insects that could be found uh, in Europe. Uh, and they are from the Porphyrophoria genus, but they were also cultivated and um, by the Inca civilization. And as soon as, as Spanish people arrived here, they were able to uh, trade this Dactylopius coccus um, species. And it is said that, and it has a much more organic uh, dye, almost as much or at least comparable to some of our best porphyrophora species. We had also kermes, so we have many, many parasitic insects, and in India it was uh, Karyolaca. So many, many, many parasitic insects that will gave us colors based on alizarin, a substituted alizarin. And for example, if you want to know more about the Armenian cochineal, you are kindly invited to go to DHA 14 and to know everything about it uh, by Irmina Grigoya. So at this time, these reds were really commercialized by this incredible network of uh, commercial, this commercial web that was in place in medieval times. And as I already anticipated, when we want to know about these dyes, the yellows, the reds, one of the ways that we have to see how they have made this is to do some CMDS. And if you are fortunate, we can uh, detect the aluminum ion. The best way will be to quantify with some method that needs a little bit more um, of a sample and it will be destructive. But with semi-DS, we can already have some clue if aluminum ion is present. And we, if we are lucky enough to have actually samples, micro samples that can really be very small for a textile, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, uh, milligrams of fiber that you can extract using a soft extraction method. Paolo will uh, go further on that. And these beautiful textiles were from this pre-Columbian civilizations and are part of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston collection. And so when you are lucky enough to have these beautiful micro samples, you can know almost everything you want to know. And you can use um, as we already show us very beautifully high performance liquid chromatography. And this coupled with us several detectors, like a detector that we call diodera detector. It will allow you to acquire um, UV visible spectra. 
but also as, as important as the diode array detector is the mass spectrometry detector that you should use if you don't know exactly what you have there. And there is much more um, detectors that we can use, but the most important for textiles are for sure uh, DID and uh, the MS detector. And now with high resolution mass spectrometry, we are going to a fantastic level of uh, accurate identification of very complex structures. Why is this important? So I have just thrown here a very simple column. We have much more sophisticated stuff that needs pumps. But anyway, the idea is that if you have two, three, four, 20, 30 components, if you have the correct solvent and the correct um, uh, um, separation powder in your column, you'll be able to separate your compounds and then you analyze one by one. And this is really important when you want to detect the plant source or the animal source of your dye. So the detector can be, as I told you, the DAD or mass spectrometry. And in the end, this is not very, very finally resolved, but for what we wanted, it was just perfect. In the end, you have like this, a chromatogram in, which every peak is a compound. And each of these molecules of these dyes has a spectra attached to it. And from this spectra and from the retention time of your molecule in this chromatogram, you can identify, you can have a chromatograph profile. This is a very simple one, but it was enough for us to know that this was a Ralbunium species that is from Peru. And these were the reds used by the pre-Columbian civilizations as the Paracas. So it can be much more complex, as I told you, but you can identify your source. And sometimes this is really important information. These are some examples, a little bit more complex, that range from beautiful Movine, the first dye, uh, um, synthetic dye invented by- Recording Kirk. in progress. Yes, got it. <laughs> um, the first dye synthesized and invented by Perkin uh, in the late 19th century, and that show us that a, a synthetic dye could make someone um, produce, uh, earn lots of money. So it was a complex molecule, beautiful color. And another example is from Dracaena Draco, and these are very different molecules. So our collaboration with the um, uh, Science Museum in London enabled us to show that the, oops, I cannot go, um, okay. So enable us to prove that, for example, the Science Museum London thought that the original recipe, because Perkin developed more than a production method, was in this flask. And we could show, based on the patents that uh, Perkin produced, that actually it was in this beautiful show. Beautiful, really. So, you know, chromatograms can help us identify, for example, a recipe. Co chromatograms for Dracaena Draco are also very complex, so everything here is a peak. But what was fantastic for us is that the color of this resin is also given by what we call a flavillium dye. It's a beautiful dye. And based on the kind of flavillium, we could distinguish between the species, Dracaena cinnabari, Dracaena Draco, the Manerotpus Draco. And this is quite important because these two are very important. There are Dracaena, they are even used in traditional Chinese medicine and not the Draco. So this is quite interesting also for us. But so when you don't have a sample, what can you do? You can use, you have alternatives. You can use, if your molecule is not fluorescent, you can use Raman and Raman is really fantastic, for example, to identify indigo. But you can also use other techniques based on Raman if your molecule is fluorescent. So I'll just show you in next slide. And we can acquire a spectra in the visible or we can acquire a spectra and emission spectra and uh, Paolo will let us know how important this technique that we have developed is the advanced technique based on what the, the, the photons emitted by the molecule can 
help us understanding about recipes and ways of producing um, endive. So ramen is a technique like infrared, but in this case, ramen is most useful for identifying molecules that don't have fluorescence directly. Ramen uh, allows you to acquire what we call a molecular fingerprint. It means that if you have the correct spectra, you can say exactly what the molecule you have. Of course, you need to have a very good database also. If your molecule is fluorescent, so here I'm showing you an example where they were using um, a, a red extracted from Karyalaka. This was also used in Persian carpets and it is fluorescent. So if you use ramen directly, you'll see nothing, but you can extract it, micro extract, and you really need uh, an infinite amount of really small, really small sample invisible to your necktie. And then you have a beautiful spectra that tells you that this is like acid A, and this is the molecule, the mo one of the most important molecules for color in Karyalaka. So again, Karyalaka year for this beautiful carmine colors and dark reds, in some Islamic manuscripts to show you that with a visible, a, a spectra in the visible, we can distinguish between vegetables and trichinones. So and trichinones uh, obtained from mother, for example, like a lizard and animal ones. So here is your mother one, and here are all the antrichinones from insects. So I can distinguish between mother uh, source, parasitic insect source, but I cannot distinguish between the, the sources of the animals. I cannot know if it's a cochineal or like that occurs with this kind of information. You see that with fluorimetry, this will be possible. So, and here you are, the first, UV, the first fluorescent spectra. This is what we call, oops, so, so sorry. This is what we call an emission spectra, and this is an excitation spectra. This spectra were obtained in a fiber from this gorgeous textile, just beautiful. And uh, we know that we have two dyes here, purpurine and pseudopurpurine. This spectra, this is like a line. It tells a lot about what is the species absorbing in the fundamental state. And this tells us that we have two chromophores, but the spectra looks simple. And for that reason, you need really to understand a lot about the photophysics of these molecules to be able to understand and, and read them. But uh, you'll see with Paula how we can go far with it. So if you want to know more about our approach and methodology, we have here some uh, papers on blue dye indigo, just using HPLC to understand the stability of it. The first papers where we have made our proof of concept of how useful it could be microspectral fluorimetry for the identification of dyes. And here the paper, the fantastic paper by uh, Paul Navaj of during her PhD that shows us how, we, how much information we can extract with this fluorescence uh, emission spectra and excitation emission spectra. Of course, for if you want to know everything about dyes, you cannot lose this fantastic book by Dominique Cardon. If you want a short uh, story, we, you can also use uh, one of our texts and or any other text of um, people from dyes in history and archaeology. So I will just now stop my share and I will leave you with Paula and the wonderful things we can do with fluorimetry. Hi, everyone. <laughs> just before discussing um, fluorimetry, we want to just show you a little bit the methodology that we use to extract uh, colors from textiles for analysis in HPLC. And is this working? Okay. 
So usually we add our very, very small sample into our extracting solution, which I will explain a little bit later. Then we um, heat it always with steering around 60 degrees, uh, 30 minutes. Then we'll check if uh, our solution already has enough color or if it needs some more. And uh, then we obviously evaporate the solvent under vacuum. The solution that we use is very, very important. Um, we use what is called soft method, uh, which is the use of oxalic acid, which is an organic acid, which has the ability to form complexes with um, aluminum, which is what usually we use to as um, a mordant, as Maria Joamel already explained. And then we have a mixture with the methanol, acetone, and water. So everything that usually our organic uh, colors molecules love. And this um, extracting, um, this method of extracting the color is very, very important because usually when we use more um, other methods which involve more strong acids, usually what we get is that we break this bond between the glucose and what we call the aglycone. So instead of seeing, for example, this molecule, which is a luthalin glucoside, we'll just see the aglycone, which is luthalin. And we lose a lot of information if we don't see all the glucosides because the glucosides really can help us to be more specific on the species, not only just, for example, um, if it's Rzeda, but if it's effectively Rzeda luteola, as for example, there are other species used. And then after evaporating the solvent, we usually use a mixture of methanol and water. We add it, we put it a little bit in the ultrasounds and we use a centrifuge and then we inject it in the HPLC to get our um, analysis. This is an example of for example, a case study that we did for a carpet in Portugal from a Chayol from the 17th century. And this is just to show you that we also compare what we get from our case studies with the extracts that we get from, example, from the plant. Here we have weld, the extract from weld. And then from a dyed textile, we can see the difference in the amount of chromophores that we have. In the textile, we have a little bit more of luthalin, while in the plant, our main chromophore is the glucoside of luthalin. And then what we see is that we get this exact match from our, uh, for example, from our textile in our case study from the Achaeolish carpets. So HPLC is a great technique. It has several advantages, such as um, advantages, sorry, there's a problem here, <laughs> with such as the DED detector, so we can get UVV spectra, um, we also have detectors, uh, mass detectors, such as Medijal may already explained, where we can get the fragmentation of the different ions. We can have quantitative and qualitative analysis. This is very, very important for us as we can quantify the amount of each um, chromophore in our sample. And it's the technique for an accurate identification of organic dyes and cultural heritage. However, we always need a sample and it's usually not recoverable. So it depends if we have this type of sample available. For example, for medieval illuminations, usually the amount of sample that it's needed is too large that we can take from medieval manuscripts. So this usually we don't use HPLC. And sometimes if you have really, really um, textiles in really bad conditions, this is not possible also. So our department really has invested in understanding other techniques and developing other methodologies that would allow us to use more in situ techniques. This is the case of fluorimetry, um, which I was very happy to develop in my PhD dissertation. So it's very interesting, as I will explain a little bit later. And we used it always with a really solid background and analysis complementary with other techniques, such as uh, fingerprinting techniques like Raman, SIRS or infrared spectroscopy. And we tested this in reconstructions, as I will explain a little bit further, and then on data that we acquired from artworks. So what are these reconstructions? So we know that there are many different ways to do these colors, either in medieval manuscripts or in textiles. There are many, many recipes, depending on the colorant that we are referring to, and they can be very specific of um, time and places in which they were used. 
So if we can get to these recipe specificities, we can prepare what we call historically accurate reconstructions of all of these colors, and we can better understand how they were prepared in their period. So this is just an example of some of the treatises that we study. Um, this is just from the 12th to the 17th century, but we also study treatises from before this period and even up until the 19th century. And if you want to know a little bit more on our methodology, when we approach all of these recipes and these treatises, please look at our article on heritage science. So after we have all of these historically accurate reconstructions, meaning after we read the recipes at the end, really digested them, and then we could make them um, come true, we prepare these colorants uh, as we would like, then we try to analyze them with our techniques and we see if we can identify the recipe markers. And if we can match these recipe markers with, for example, an artwork, then we can more easily answer the questions when and where an artwork was produced. So this is where fluorescence can be so, so useful. Like it was said before, it has an excitation and an emission spectra, as you can see here in the image. It's very sensitive and very selective. It has a really good spatial resolution, the possibility of in-depth profiling, meaning that you can really analyze several layers of your, um, of your sample. And although it's great on samples, you really don't need them, meaning that you can put your artwork directly on the stage and analyze it in situ. However, it still needs complementary techniques because we can get a lot of a lot of information, which can be very difficult to handle. Uh, in fact, uh, just for you to explain what we're looking for, a fluorescent spectrum is affected. So all of this spectrum is affected by the interactions of the molecule with its close environment. And this is great. That's why it's so sensitive and so selective, because we can understand the molecule not only as the color center, but also in its interactions with the environment. And what we mean by environment is the recipe. So for example, when we have in the textile, we have the, the chromophore linked through the textile using a mordant. When we have a lake pigment, it's very much the same. Instead of having the mordant linked to a textile, we have it linked to another chromophore molecule. And so all of these steps within a recipe are very, very important for the information that we can acquire from fluorescence. It's very sensitive to um, the type of extraction that we have, especially because just using acid or base using the same source, we can have different colors. It's very sensitive to the filtration present in our recipe. It's very sensitive to the amount of mordant that we have. If this, the colors here present are just from having more or less aluminum in the recipe. And even the addition of additives can also alter our color. So all of these are colors obtained from the same recipe just by changing specific steps within the recipe. And fluorescence is a sensitive technique to all of this. So what we get is a lot of data with hundreds and hundreds of spectra of complex information. So like Maria Jean said, just by looking at it, it's very, very difficult for an untrained eye to be able to understand what it says. So that's why we decided to use a statistical approach, which we call chemometrics. So chemometrics is a science of extracting information from chemical systems. So it's a statistical method in which we extract the maximum relevant information by analyzing data. This means that uh, chemometrics is going to look at the spectra that we add, and it's going to say which parts of the spectra really can be better at differentiating between our uh, recipes or our colorants or whatever we want to between. So for example, we use usually two different types of chemometrics. We use principal component analysis, which maybe some of you are already very familiar with. And then what I'm going to show a little bit more here is the hierarchical cluster analysis, in which this case, it says, for example, that if one recipe is very, it's similar to another, for example, the green here in, this, in the graphic, we see that the green 
uh, samples are close to one another, but then it says that it's a little bit different from the ones that we have in pink. And so it starts forming all of these trees, these cluster trees based on the similarity and differences that it finds on the data that we have put in. And so we decided to test this approach first on um, just our historical reconstruction. So we um, added information on four red colorants that we know that were either used or are extensively described in medieval treatises. So Kermes, Lacdai, Cochineal, and Brazil wood. And it was really a great first approach as it was able to identify the source of the colorant even among colorants from the same chemical family. For example, he clearly says that Brazil wood, which is the red ones, are very different from cochineal, lacti, and kermes, which are the anthraconomes. That one we already expected. But it was really interesting to see that um, using this approach, we can tell that fluorimetry is sensitive enough to detect the differences between kermes, lacti, and cochineal. So we thought maybe we can go a little bit further. Maybe you can start to identify the recipe as it's so sensitive to the environment. And so we decided to focus on just on lac dye and Brazil wood with data extracted from um, several medieval manuscripts in Portuguese collections. And it was so interesting because it was able to pinpoint specific recipes just for the same colorant. So for example, in the case of lac dye, it was able to differentiate when lac dye is present as a lake pigment, meaning that it was complexed with, uh, with the mordant aluminum, or when it's just present as a resin. In this case, it's the upper green black one. This is where it's with the resin, while the other ones are when it's present as a lake pigment. Then for Brazil wood, it was able to differentiate when we have different additives. For example, the green one is when we have a calcium carbonate and lead white present in the formulations. And then it separated the other two, depending on the amount of gypsum present on the formulation. So if it has too much or too little gypsum present in the formulation, it was able to differentiate between this as well. More interestingly is that for the first time, we were able to identify a manuscript in which we have uh, a mixture between both colorants, lacti and Brazil wood. And it was really awesome because we also have a recipe in a manuscript which describes this preparation and it's an exact match with this recipe. And with other techniques, we were only able to detect one or the other. So actually fluorescence was able to detect both. So it's really cool. Um, obviously, we have used fluorescence to analyze textiles and to identify the colorant present, but because we know it has a huge potential to go after the recipes, that this is what our next step will be. So we want to use this approach to textiles that have already been analyzed, but not uh, in this depth. And we want to see if we can really start to separate the different uh, formulations present. Thank you so much. So now maybe... You can go to the questions. Thank you very much. That has been very, very interesting. So in a sense, um, the main difference with HPLC is that no sample is necessary with this technique. Yes, you can you can study directly also on the sample. Sometimes there's an advantage, but you don't touch your sample. So you can, you know, you can have a micro sample and you can do all your analysis and the sample will stay forever. When we do HPLC, we need to extract. If we use soft methods, you still have your fiber, but usually it's not the same fiber because it was on a solvent and you eat it. But yes, you, can also, you can also uh, um, use it directly on the textile. I, if the textile is a fragment, it's perfect. But if it's a big carpet, I think yes. it's always better to, to, you know, really to have microsample. 
So even if one takes a sample, then the sample remains perfect unaltered. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's so it's very crudely and very basically a Raman technique. Uh, no, it's it's no. not a Raman technique because with Raman or infrared, um, you are um, acquiring a spectra, a simulacrum of your molecule based on vibrations of the molecule. Yes. And here it's based on what on molecules that are able to emit photons. You know. Molecules that are bright, uh, now we have lots of molecules that are bright, you know, when you, we are using things. So it's detecting photons. And so it's a, again a simulacrum of the reality, but it's a different spectrum. One is based on vibration, so it's a vibrational spectrum. And this one is based on the photons emitted by molecules. <laughs> So what kind of equipment would one need to do this technique? So we, we are using microspectral fluorimetry, but then I will also <laughs> let, let Paula add it. We start with the microspectral fluorimetry many years ago because we were studying also um, miniatures. So very minute details, but in the uh, Indian textile, sometimes you, are, you have also these very minute details. And so being able to excite really just the pigment in a complex matrix was huge difference because we are really exciting a pigment in a, a paint. So that for us was very important. For textiles, I think we can try to also work with the handheld equipment that are already now some on the market. They are very light and maybe they will be also nice to test. What equipment, sorry? It's like handheld with the uh, fiber optics, you know, very oh, okay. small equipment. It's like a source. And so you don't, you lose your special resolution, but uh, for textile, maybe it will not be an issue for certain things at least. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Thank you, Maria and Paula. <laughs> it's always great to hear you and see you once again. Like uh, wonderful technique. I like it. Uh, the only thing, Paula, as I would say uh, in the slide that you said that in HPLC you need a lot of material, I humbly pleasantly disagree with you because you can do analyses on even on a single fiber not a thread but a fiber from a from a thread which i've done in one of the uh, articles and you can actually get all the components this was a purple real purple and you can actually see the brominated indigoids for them in the rubin it's uh, it was amazing uh, it's very difficult to get just a single fiber, but it is uh, destructive, but it's, I would not even call it micro destructive, I would even call it nano destructive. Um, yeah. So, you know, well, yeah, yes, we should have um, um, explained several times during the presentation that we are just looking into yellows and reds, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and in this case, we are trying to not destroy the fiber or destroy it as less as possible. And you have the problem of the aluminum ion. So it's never possible to extract everything. We just extra extract, you know, really a very minute amount of the fiber. The fiber remains almost as it is in terms of color. So that's why we need some more amount. <laughs> okay. So as far, apart from the fact that uh, it does not destroy the, or alter the sample, um, how would you compare it to HPLC, uh, strictly on the results that you get? So I think that's a really very good question. So if you want to identify the source, and if you have some sample, I think you should go to the HPLC, but you don't need to use it for all your fibers. You know, you need just to use it with one. And then we, you can acquire 
spectra with this kind of technique, like microspectrofluorimetry, because I think in the end, it will give you details on the recipes. And that's something that is not yet studied for the textiles. So, so, you know, if you have this sample, you know what is the source or what is there, but you cannot say, oh, this, this, this was this kind of recipe. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to say, oh, these guys were dying this like that. I don't know. For medieval illuminations, we are able to prove it. For textiles, we still have a long way. Yeah, so, I don't think but, it has to be one or the other. No. Like, like Professor Medjian said, it can be complementary techniques. You can, if you're studying a carpet, you can use HPLC for specific analysis, and then fluorescence can give you a broader look on the recipes and how, even if the fluoresce, if um, HPLC says it's uh, all rubia, maybe fluorescence can tell you different um, recipes of rubia are present, you know, so they can, doesn't have to be one or the other. <laughs> They complement yes. each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's so how we use them usually, really. Not for the medieval manuscript illumination because it's, they are really too small to be able to, you know, but for the textiles, for sure, yes. I think that is a very interesting uh, potential to co combine them and to, or to have information about the recipes. Yes, that, that would be very interesting. <laughs> Um, we have a question uh, about the about if if the work is time consuming and if it is expensive. Microfluorometry? No, five minutes if you are good. <laughs> really? No, really less. The problem is that the spectra you need to know how to read the spectra, so. As the next step, Paula and João Lopes, which, which is our, our expert in chemometrics, will develop an algorithm that will allow people to use a database, but that's for the future. <laughs> for us, so, if you know the molecules, you can tell from the spectra what kind of molecules, but you know to know a lot about these molecules. So to allow it to be used for a larger public, we need to provide this algorithm and a good database. So this is something you use now only? Yes, yes, always. <laughs> always. And is it expensive? This is the yeah, same it, it, yeah. So uh, if our microspectrofluorometer, to buy it, you can say it's expensive, but then the spectres are not expensive. You know, it's really quick. For the handheld, I think the handheld equipments that are already in the market, I think they are much less expensive. I would say 30,000 euro, three, three zero. Our equipment is more expensive. <laughs> I'll get my credit card ready. Hmm? I'll get Sorry? my credit card ready. <laughs> you have your credit. <laughs> So yes, I think it will be nice, for example, to have this facility, for example, us, being able to do analysis for others, but for the moment, you know, we, we don't have yet it, that um, operation. Do you, you think or have you tried to apply it to textiles that are degraded? So, the quick answer is no, but I think that's where this technique can also be exceptional because we also selected to use microspectrofluorimetry because the levels of detection are the maximum you can get. Mm -hmm. So it can see it's the lowest, the lowest, I think it's the best technique to identify if the molecule is present. If the so, molecules are present. Is, is, is present and is fluorescent. So the molecule needs also to be fluorescent, okay? Um, so I think it will be an exceptional technique for textiles, not for purple. Purple doesn't fluoresce. That's why we didn't have here purple, okay? Purple because 
Yeah, we have a similar question. Jane, would you like to make your question? I think it's uh, relevant now to I'm, what um, we're talking about. I'm, uh, have I understood correctly that you've only developed this method so far for reds and yellows? But is it possible that you can develop it for other colors, if not for purple? Yes, so, but reds and yellows are already a huge amount of species. So for reds, yes, yellows, we started and we have done some work on, on it, but it will be also the work of Paolo Navaj to do it more systematically, but we have a lot of work also on yellows. Um, and also other synthetic colors that not I'm um, not. I'm interested because I have a lot of samples where there are suspected colors, particularly for this is um hats in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And looking at them now, as Christina says they're degraded, it's not easy to guess. Um would would it be possible to say whether there were several colors? in a in a sample if you have samples we can for sure first analyze them using microspectrofluorimetry that will be perfect and then maybe we can use also hplc ms you know to have even further further information but usually we start always with the microspectrofluorimetry and then uh, we move forward if we have samples to HPLC. It's very, it's very exciting because I, 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 one of the reasons I've hesitated to get dye analysis done on my samples is that I only have so much sample material. And the idea that I'm, I'm not going to exhaust my sample means I can make it go further, which is yes. that's really, that's, that kind of opens the horizons for what I could, you know, it was hard work to get the samples and I want to get the most out of them. So yeah, this is a sure. very exciting prospect. Yeah. When when can I send them to you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, how many samples are they? I've got at least 60. They're all from knitted hats in the 15th and 16th century. Yes, maybe next year because, because right now we were doing an upgrade and the French team could not come, and it was a Portuguese technician and making the story short. The instrument now doesn't work. <laughs> so, but hopefully, hopefully, we'll be able to have the French technicians here and everything will be working again anyway. Thank you. But next year, yes, we'll be really happy to collaborate, really. That's right. all about what. Zero web, I think. <laughs> I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Do you work with funding? So you try to find funding and do projects? Yes. Yes. <laughs> because this is something uh, if uh, people are interested and we have this die group also at Euroweb, maybe this is something, you know, if someone were interested to contribute with samples and time to write a proposal to do a common thing through the die group of the Euroweb, because I really think it's a... Um, it's a very promising uh, alternative, especially because the sample is not consumed. Because sometimes you do need very a very, very small sample with HPLC, that's for sure. But sometimes, depending on the country you are, uh, the collection belongs to, and the, 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 the laws and the rules they have, you, you are limited the moment you say destructive. So I think the potential is very, very important with this technique. Yes. So we are just exciting, and the radiation is very soft. It's not a laser. So that's really good also, so no damage. And then you collect your emission and excitation spectrum and from mm -hmm. them, you know, you proceed to analysis. <laughs> yeah, we think it's really a nice technique. <laughs> that's why you propose it, to bring it to you. <laughs> but as Paulo was saying, if it's possible, complementing it with HPLC is great. If not, at least we have this data and it's already important data. 
Yes, I think it's very, very interesting and important. And thank you very much for presenting this to us. Uh, are there any more questions from our audience? No, I think uh, we're all good. Yes, we thank everybody to be here with us and we love We you thank you time. very much Obrigado. and everybody for being here. <laughs> Obrigada. Thank you. That was very, very Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.